beneficial. Although it was good for because it was everything was very dry at some point, but um, yeah, Help, yeah, helps tamp down the fires. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's some that's one natural disaster we don't have to worry about here. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this was very scary this year. That last year was very bad. Mm. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So is, is Boulder uh, having any uh, open searches for AMO people? No, no. I mean, we had a recent hire, Shu uh, uh, Sang, and he is more in nanophotonics. I mean, trying to connect a little bit more with Conrad work. Uh, okay. Um, that, that is our recent uh, hire. And he yes. got stuck in China for a while. So but actually, it's this fall when he's actually starting here in person. Mm, oh, OK. So. Yeah, visa problem. Trying yes, to visa problems with COVID, things, uh, everything yeah. was very slow. Um, yeah, so but finally, he's. I mean, he's here. Uh, so we are so good. happy to have him. Um, and and we will see. The, the problem is that um, we, uh, we will see. We we are trying to see if we can get a new building because we are really tight in the space. Really? Oh. Yes. The new, how old is the new Jill building? It's, it's, it's 2010, I think. The, the 2000, okay. no, sorry, 2000, sorry, 2014, 2000. Okay. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's new. It's no, but still we we are really struggling for space now. So we, uh, we need more. Mm. Yeah, we have a relatively new building also, uh, 2010. And I know what you mean. You start running out of space and uh, it's really, uh, really challenging. Yes, exactly. So if you want to, to really attract great people, you cannot offer very small space, uh, all the yeah. space that we have. So this is something that is in our priority. Let's see if, if them with the Biden. I mean, we have we might. This is always our our saver, saver. So so we can see if if, if with the Biden administration we can get a little bit more of support uh, through uh -huh. the government to build a, a new one. I don't know. We are trying to explore this option. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep, so. Yep. Uh, what about in rice are you planning to hire new people in amo we are we are we have uh two searches in uh in the physics department fantastic experimentalists so uh, in case any any of your students are at the stage of looking for jobs that's uh keep an eye out for our announcement okay fantastic but they're experimentalists experimentalists, experimentalists. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, I I can't tell June's group, uh, and I mean the experimental is here around. I mean, yes, uh -huh. that, that's very exciting. Yeah, and then in the engineering department, there's also a position. Okay. Okay. So they're Fantastic. they're uh, also interested in quantum. Yes, that that's great. So we we also try. I mean, with the Qubit Center, we are trying to connect more with engineering too. So it's great that these tides are getting closer uh -huh. and closer. It yes. Is. yes. Is, is everybody that engaged in, in quantum physics located in the Jilla building? Not everybody. I mean, we have a little bit of astrophysics, a little bit of biophysics. Um, I don't know if you can say that Margaret is doing quantum. I, I don't know. I mean, she does quantum, but it's not. It's, it's a different type of perspective of quantum. Yes. Ultra Applied fast. quantum. Applied quantum. Yes. Imaging. Uh, um, but I think the majority is interested in quantum. I can I can say yes, the majority. Uh -huh. la, um, and yes, I mean definitely we are trying to to see how we can pri pri prioritize quantum even more. Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so definitely that's a direction that we want to continue pushing uh, with. I mean we have. The QSense that is the NSF center and the QSA that is the um, the DOE center. So with right. that, a lot of right. nice motivation right. to continue doing quantum. Yeah, you have a lot of leverage. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. And of course, NIS priority has been on quantum for many years. Yes, with with clocks it's, and astrology. Is there space 
near the Jula building for an additional building? Yes, we are planning. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, in principle, yes. Uh, and and that's, you don't have, that's, that's you don't have to tear down anything. No, no, no. In principle, there, I mean, we want to make it in below underground to, uh, to okay. do the space for for labs. So okay, I see. That that's kind of the vision, and well. Yeah. Let's see. I mean, everything is pending, but but seems that Obama is really interested in investing in science, and so maybe we we we'll, we can have a sur surprise uh, in the next uh, few months. Let's see. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's not not too late. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly, exactly. Randy, do you want to start sharing your screen? It's now sure. not five, and so maybe we can start. Mm. Yes. Uh... Leo, Leo here. Leo yeah. is going to be ten minutes late. He he will arrive between okay. nine fifteen and nine thirty. So we don't need to wait for okay. him. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Yes. So can I. You see? Yes, we can see your screen, and okay. I think it's already uh, starting to stream um, in YouTube. So I think we can start, Randy, if you are okay with that. All right. Very good. Let's go ahead and get started then. So. Um, this is the third and last lecture that I'll be giving, and uh, I'm going to finish up what we started talking about on uh, Thursday, yesterday, which is pairing of spin polarized Fermi gases. So let me move ahead to where we stopped. So um, in three dimensions in a trap, the spin polarization is manifested in a shell-like structure of different phases. And just for to, to be clear what we're talking about, the cell structure consists of a um, balanced superfluid, which we call SF0. This is a superfluid in which P, the polarization, the number of atoms in the upspin minus the number of atoms in the downspin divided by the total number of atoms, that polarization is zero in this balanced superfluid. And that in three dimensions sits in the center of the trap. This is the green area. And then next comes a shell of the polarized superfluid, which I denote by this kind of reddish orange color. Um, this is a, actually a, pol a polarized phase, meaning that there is some upspin, some downspin, but they're not equal. And that could be either a superfluid, partially polarized superfluid, or a normal uh, partially polarized phase. And so that's the, these middle two. Then the last one is a fully polarized normal phase. So this is like a ferromagnetic phase. These are all uh, upspin atoms. And depending on the parameters of the system, so I'm assuming here everything's at t equals zero, but by adjusting um, uh, interactions and polarizations, we might get a, some of these phases, but not all, or in some cases, you can actually see all uh, three of these phases. The kind of, the way we're detecting them is by in situ density imaging. So we have an imaging technique where we actually map out the density profile of the upspins and the downspins and so you can actually see what region is in this, for example, this SF0 phase, where uh, you have an unpolarized superfluid core, the one denoted by the green. So this is an example of that. So um, the, my, the majority atoms are denoted by black. This is a, a density. We use something called the Abel transform to transform a column density into a real density distribution. So the black is the majority, the upspins. The blue is the minority spin, which is the downspins. And the, their difference, which is the spin density, is in red. And where that spin density is zero, that means you have an unpolarized region. So that corresponds to being uh, having a superfluid core, which is unpolarized. That's what's shown here in green. So this is a uh, phase diagram, which is expressed in somewhat funny uh, units. The 
polarization is on the horizontal axis, um, but the scaled radius in the trap is on the vertical axis. And so zero is the center of the trap. And as I go uh, away from the center of the trap and go upwards, let's say on this phase diagram, to larger radii, I cut through these phases as I go. So um, the blue line here is the marking the uh, regions that go from a partially polarized phase, in which there's some ups, in which there's some downspins, mixed mixing with with upspins, and when I go up a little bit further in radius, I come to this region where uh, the that shell is this blue one is fully polarized. This is the ferromagnetic shell where all the atoms are in the spin up state. So of, of particular interest is what polarization for a given interaction strength, this happens to be at unitarity. Remember we talked about the BEC BCS crossover using a Feshbach resonance. And here we're employing the Feshbach resonance to adjust that interaction strength. So this means that I'm right at, at 832 Gauss, I'm right at the place where the scattering length goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And at unitarity, you can see that that balanced superfluid core begins to disappear when I get to a cloud polarization of about 80%. And so beyond that, the superfluid core breaks. There's no more uh, superfluid in the, in the system. And unless this partially polarized phase is a superfluid. So this is called the uh, clogston chandra shekhar limit. And it just tells us that how much polarization can the gas withstand uh, before the superfluidity breaks. And in this case, at this interaction strength, that's about 80%. All right, so any questions so far? So all, right. they, all this, yes. and Randy, all the points yeah. are experimental points. There is no theory there, yes. all these experimental points, yes? Yes, these are all, this is all coming from experiments. So this is all coming from data such as this one. Okay. So, so here we're showing that at this radius um, that the superfluid core um, disappears, mm -hmm. you know, beyond that radius. And so that's, we can do that then by uh, using the Feshbach resonance to vary this interaction strength. And we can get a whole phase diagram that I'll show here in a minute um, for, uh, as a function of uh, interaction strength. Great, great. I think there is another question that it says, is there a physical way to understand this phase separation? This kind of reminds of how oil and water separate. Yeah, exactly. So it's energetic. So um, the superfluid core uh, exists because it's energetically costly to have a, uh, an excess spin up atom penetrate into this region. And so um, the superfluid core is the lowest energy state uh, at this interaction strength. Okay, so is one more question. It is yes. in, in the superfluid to normal phase. How you experimental de demonstrate if it's um, actually a superfluid? So he's asking yeah. about the distinction between these two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So we don't actually measure any superfluid properties other than the fact that it phase separates and has, you know, some phase coherence in that respect. So um, there, yeah, so we don't measure vortices or anything like that. So there's an assumption being made that this un unpolarized core is a superfluid. And I think that that's, you know, a, a very justifiable assumption uh, given that um, it separates a partially polarized phase and uh, with, a, with a hard boundary, it turns out this is a first order phase transition. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the purple line is just at the maximum of the imbalance, yes? Of the it's, a maximum, it's a maximum of the imbalance 
that we were uh, pointing out in in uh, in this paper and the significance of that, but it's a little bit of a detail. Okay, great. Okay, so um, this is a uh, plot of the loss of that superfluid core, the unpolarized superfluid core, as a function of interaction strength. So here the interaction is negative. This corresponds to the BCS regime out in here. This is unitarity again, and this is the BEC regime. So this line is a first order phase transition, this, this black line in the BCS regime. And it shows us that as we go further or deeper into the BCS side, <clears throat> that this, um, superfluid core becomes more and more fragile and eventually disappears. So this is uh, again, a measure of that Clarkson limit as a function of uh, interaction strength. And as we go to the other side, uh, the superfluid core also uh, breaks down when I'm below. Um, so this is our data, the orange and the, and the, and the uh, green. I should mention that um, we call this PC3D. This is the critical polarization where in three dimensions that we lose the unpolarized superfluid core. So out in here, this is a Bose-Fermi mixture. So this is bosons and fermions coexisting. And so there, you know, there's nothing, the, the polarized core can admit a, uh, un a, uh, an excess upspin atom um, in this region, but not out in here, not in below these below this line. Okay, so um, so what does that mean in the context of FFLO? So this is the mean field phase diagram, actually that was done by Sheehy and Radziowski. So mm -hmm. from our uh, professor Leo. Uh, his work back in uh, 2007. And uh, they showed that there was, uh, this is again a function of interaction strength, uh, minus one over KFA. And this is a function of polarization on this axis. And so they showed that there was phase separation in a large part of this phase diagram. Um, at too great a polarization, we have a normal phase on the BCS side. And over here, we have a, a, a magnetized superfluid, which is the same thing that we've been calling a polarized superfluid. And right in, in here in red is the predicted FFLO phase. So it's theoretically predicted by, um, by not only she and Radziowski, but others as well. Um, but it's always been um, very thin, wedge of the phase diagram um, that where it's possible to have perhaps to see FFLO. So in a trap, especially given that we have inhomogeneous density, it would be very challenging to pass through this FFLO region very quickly and be able to discern any changes in the density profile. So this is actually very, um, a little bit disheartening for those of us interested in FFLO, uh, the FFLO phase, uh, because this suggests that at least in a trap, it would not be possible to see unless this was significantly broader. So what happens in one dimension? <clears throat> so in 3D, we have this, this uh, uh, shell-like structure with an unpolarized superfluid in the middle, <clears throat> surrounded by a partially polarized phase. That's what the P means, which could be normal or could be superfluid, depending on the interaction strength. And then a ferromagnetic phase where everything spin up in this blue, in this blue shell. So that's what, <clears throat> what it looks like experimentally. So in the middle, this is a, a measurement of the spin density, an image of the spin density. And in the middle of the cloud, there is uh, the spin density goes to zero. That corresponds to this superfluid shell in this middle part. 
And then there's around the edges there, the spin density rises from zero to some finite value. And those are the other two shells that have uh, some uh, non-zero spin density, they're polarized. So either the, the brown shell or the, the blue one. Now in 1D, it's very surprising. It's very different in one dimension. And this one dimension, FF below in one dimension is really interesting. The phase separation is inverted in 1D. And so instead of having the unpolarized superfluid core in the center, it instead sits in the wings. And in the center instead is, a, is the FF below phase. And this is all predicted by what's called beta onsat calculation exact theory um, in which there is no ambiguity. This is actually, um, as long as you're cold enough, this is, a, this is the FFLO state in the center. So why is 1D different than 3D in this respect? Well, it turns out that in one dimension, low density is a higher, stronger interaction region than high density, which is opposite for the 3D case. In the 1D case, uh, the kinetic energy scales in such a way that it, um, um, it dominates um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the high density region. And only when you go out to low densities do you see this, this balanced superfluid out in the edges. Now you might also see, you only see two phases at a time in one dimension, and that's distinct from 3D. You can only see a FFLO plus a balanced superfluid, or you could see FFLO and a ferromagnetic phase, one or the other. And I'll show you in a, in a moment why that is. So this is the phase diagram. This is actually from, uh, from Orso uh, in 2007, in which the axes are the total chemical potential the sum of the spin up chemical potential and the spin down divided by H, which is defined to be the difference in the chemical potentials, also called the magnetization or polarization. So this is related to the, to the polarization P. So at low polarizations, where, you, where you're close to uh, being balanced, um, this phase, the first thing, the, the first thing you, you encounter as you're moving um, from the center of the trap to the edges. So let me show a line here. If I'm uh, on this line and I'm at the center of the trap where the chemical potential is greatest and I move vertically downwards, I'm moving towards the edges of the, um, of the trap of the distribution. And that's where the chemical potential crosses into the vacuum, crosses zero and you enter into the vacuum region. So this is FFLO in the center. As I go away from the center and go towards the edges of the, of the trap, um, I pass through this balanced superfluid phase and then eventually into the vacuum. So why is it that as I move from the center to the edges of the trap, that I move on a vertical line on this phase diagram because it's because there's the, the gas is in chemical equilibrium. And so H is constant everywhere in the trap. And so if I have a particular value of H at the center, I'll have that same H as I move away from the center. And that what changes then in the, uh, in the trap is the chemical potential. It's maximized in the center and it gets smaller as you move away from the center. Now, this is an example where I have FF below in the center and a P equals zero superfluid in the, in the wings. Now, this is an example of the other scenario where I have FF below in the center, but now I have fully polarized in the wings. So this is, here's the schematic showing how I'm moving and with those black vertical lines, I'm moving from the center of the trap to the edges. So those are the two phases in this phase, two scenarios in this phase diagram that I can observe, I should, I should observe experimentally. So I should observe 
an FFLO in the center, and either uh, a fully polarized, a unpolarized superfluid in the wings, or a fully polarized normal gas in the wings, one or the other. Randy, how does this depend on the interaction? So th there is no interaction parameter there included. Um, it's in it's inside these chemical potentials. Inside the chemical potential, mm -hmm. yeah, but so if these... you go to weak interacting at some point, things disappear. Yeah, so the chemical potential is getting weaker as I go out to the edges of the of this trap. Um, and eventually I hit vacuum where the chemical potential is zero. So the interactions are encoded in these uh, chemical potentials. Okay, great. Okay. So um, you wouldn't be able, if you had a, I just, this as an aside, uh, you wouldn't be able to be able to go, cut through the phase diagram in this way if you had a box potential. So the chemical potential in a box potential is uniform, unlike in a in a trap where it varies due to the inhomogeneity of the density profile. So that actually is an advantage here because you can map out a phase diagram um, at a particular interaction strength and polarization, you can put a point on a phase diagram um, from just doing one experiment in a trap. All right, so this is what the experiment looks like. We're studying the one-dimensional uh, physics. We have a two-dimensional optical lattice. And the two-dimensional optical lattice means I have a standing wave and the potential going in that along that axis and another going in this axis. And the result of that is to produce an array, a two-dimensional array of one-dimensional tubes. So if I look at the dimension coming in and out of this, of this uh, figure, um, that's, a big, that's the axis along here where it's unconfined or weakly confined harmonically. And otherwise it, it produces these uh, these these one D tubes that you can fill up with atoms and realize a quasi one dimensional uh, system. And the rest of these things, this is the Zeeman slower is for slowing a, the atomic beam to load a magneto optical trap, and then it gets transferred to a single beam optical trap, and then it, we do evaporation in that. And then we turn on these, these pairs of lattice beams, which are indicated in the green and the, the red lines. So this is what the data looks like in 1D. It's also, there's also phase separation in 1D. And um, again, the black is the spin up and the blue is the spin down uh, density profile. And, um, and I'm showing four different cases of polarization ranging from about one and a half percent polarization. This is about five and a half percent, 10 percent, and 33 percent. Now, um, also, in addition to the density profiles of the spin up and spin down atoms, I'm showing their difference. And that's the spin density. And the spin density is very. Uh, is a very nice way of determining where the, the balanced superfluid phase is. And so where this spin density is zero and there's still finite number of atoms uh, in the cloud, so the black and the blue are non-zero, um, this is the region where there's the balanced superfluid phase. So this is where it's totally, totally balanced uh, wing. This is a very low polarization where, the, where as I showed on the previous slide, um, you could have either two scenarios at low polarization. You have FFLO in the center and a P equals zero phase in the wing. Whereas at high polarization, you can start to see that as you go up in polarization that 
this unpolarized region is getting bigger, the FFLO region is extending until eventually it extends all the way to the, to the length of the cloud itself. And so everything is partially polarized out until this dashed line. This dashed line indicates where uh, the, the atom density goes to zero, that you enter into the vacuum. Uh, I, and there, Randy, there, yeah. is, there is a question that she says, can you explain again, what is the meaning of vacuum phase in your previous slide? Yeah, so um, that's illustrated actually well on this slide. So um, beyond to the right of this vertical dash line, is where um, the densities go to zero. And so uh, when the upspin density and the downspin density are zero, then we've entered into a vacuum. There are no atoms there. OK. Um, so um, this, this polarization around 10% is interesting because it says that the entire distribution is partially polarized. And we know from that calculation that that partially polarized phase is FFLO. So this should all be FFLO from here to here. And as I go to larger polarization, this is 33%, then it starts going the other way. Instead of having uh, in the wing a P equals zero phase where the spin density is zero, I have in the wings a, um, a, a phase where the, the downspin density goes to zero. And so that's a fully polarized upspin ferromagnetic state of all upspin beyond to the right of this dashed line. That makes sense. It's a bit complicated, but uh, if you bear with me, uh, I'll, I'll get you through it. Any questions so far? Okay, so the idea is, is that we you know, choose a particular value of interaction, which is determined by the magnetic field. We have a lattice that uh, as we saw yesterday or the day before, a lattice that has some depth, uh, in this case, 12 recoils. 12 recoils is enough that the tunnel coupling between these tubes is very small and we can ignore it. This is a very good quasi 1D system where the, uh, the H bar omega perp, where omega perp is the transverse energy of the transverse confinement is much bigger than the chemical potential. And so this is a, a very good approximation of a one dimensional system. Okay. So these are just little cartoons showing that this is the region where uh, everything is in this center polarized uh, portion of the distribution. Everything is there and we call that PC or PC1D to uh, differentiate it from PC3D that I was showing before. The PC3D is where the balance core disappears. PC1D is where uh, the entire cloud becomes FFLO and there's none of these other phases in the wing. So beyond PC1D, there's the FFLO in the center and it upspins on the edges. And below PC1D, um, we have the FFLO in the center and the balanced superfluid on the edges. Okay. So this is what the phase diagram looks like. So this is in collaboration with Eric Mueller, theorist, who was able to calculate this phase diagram, not in terms of, of mu and h, but rather in terms of things that we measure, which are the radii of these phase boundaries, uh, the vertical axis, and the central tube polarization, or p, on this horizontal axis. So in order to express the polarization, um, we define it to be the central tube and right in the center of the distribution. So this red line is where the, the uh, spin density um, 
is is the spin density, and the blue line is the uh, boundary of uh, the down spins, the minority spin. So, um, so now you could see that at small radii, the, the we start off with something which is in, um, depending on our central tube polarization, we start off down here along this axis at the center of the trap. And if we're at small polarization, then we go vertically. Polarization is constant throughout the gas. So we go vertically and we cross a phase boundary where we go from FFLO in the center. And as we go further up on this vertical line, we cut through this green portion where the polarization is zero. And conversely, if we, and you can see that from this data. So again, the black are the upspin densities, the blue, the downspin, and the red is the, is the spin density. So, um, yeah, so this, this just is showing the difference between a finite temperature, 175 nanokelvin, which fit our data the best. This is the only free parameter in arriving at this uh, theoretical phase diagram. Uh, and this is what it looks like at t equals zero. It's a little bit, it, this slope of this line goes up a little bit further. Okay. So that agrees really well. And so we now have, although we don't have any direct evidence of FFLO, we certainly have a agreement with a phase diagram, a theoretical phase diagram, which is essentially exact, um, that has FFLO in it. And in fact, FFLO is a major portion of this phase diagram. So that's, that's interesting and exciting, but what we really need to do is figure out a way of measuring uh, a, a property that is conclusive of for FFLO physics. And FFLO is really defined by um, these uh, finite center of mass momentum pairs. And so we need to figure out a way of showing that. Um, and in 1D, it's a bit of a problem as I'll discuss next. So, um, so remember again, if we contrast these phase diagrams between 3D and 1D, um, this is the, at unitarity, this is the 3D phase diagram of, again, scaled radius versus cloud polarization. This is the Clogston limit that we've seen before. This is a polarized or normal super, it's a polarized normal or superfluid phase. And then this is the fully polarized phase in blue. And uh, the same, using the same axes, the scaled radius versus the polarization, um, we can map out the 1D phase diagram and you can see how different these phase diagrams are between 3D and 1D. So by 2010, we had done this. We had figured all this out. We were able to map out this phase diagram uh, in 3D and, um, and in 1D. And there is FFLO, we're pretty sure there's FFLO here. But since we don't have t equals zero distribution, we can't say for sure that it has the FFLO properties of the finite um, center of mass momentum pairs. So our measured phase diagram is consistent with FFLO, but it's not direct evidence for FFLO. Randy, is the, uh, is, yeah. can I just ask, is the figure on the left, the 3D one, is that, is that data or is that numerics or what is it? That's that's data. And that's from your lab? Yeah. And is this, uh, when you say it's 3D, is it still tubes but strongly coupled or there's no optical lattice no, at all? There's no optical lattice at all. So this is strictly oh, 3D. And so this actually, this data was published in 2015. Okay. And there's and no, there are, uh, there's no FFLO there at all? Um, not that we're aware of. Um, we, we don't see it. And if we trust your mean field phase diagram, it would be a tiny sliver, I guess, on the yeah. BCS side of the 
yeah, the Peshbach yeah. residence. And we we saw you know nothing there that that could be a hint of of uh, trying to indicate to us that it was FFLO. I see. Thank you. Yeah. So this brings us up to a few years ago. Um, so actually in 2007, Mira Parrish suggested in this paper that the 1D, 3D dimensional crossover might be the ideal place to look for uh, evidence of FFLO physics. And the reason why is that you can, in these two-dimensional optical lattice systems, you can turn the lattice depth down to be able to increase this tunnel coupling. And so I can actually make this quasi one-dimensional system look three, look more like a 3D system if, I, if my tunnel coupling is sufficiently big. And that's kind of a, a nebulous statement um, but it, as I'll show you, it can be made very precise because we know the difference in this system between 1D and 3D. They have very different phase diagrams. And so we can right. find the tun tunnel coupling that in which, um, in which uh, this system goes from being 1D-like to being 3D-like. Yeah, yeah. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah. If you, people want to unmute themselves and ask. Or you could read them yourself. Anybody? Uh, anybody? Anybody there? So do you, uh, uh, people want to unmute? Uh, can, yeah. Can I ask a question? I will, I, I yeah. was about to the chat. Is is there an, an effect of the fact that when you when you have these one D tubes and you start coupling? You don't necessarily have like a guess itself. You have like discrete hops. How does that affect the three D phase diagram and the, the expected crossover? Yeah, so it's a it's a very uh, special kind of dimensional crossover. Um, it's hard to really call it a three D, but maybe you call it a quasi one D to quasi three D dimensional crossover. Um, a maybe a more conventional way of talking about a 1D to 3D crossover would be to take a single tube or a single wire and increase its dimensions, yeah, radially to where, um, to where it becomes uh, a, a three-dimensional system. It, it, it occupies many of these radial modes, not a single one. But in our system, it occupies still a single ra uh, radial mode uh, but there's coupling between tubes, nearest neighbor coupling between tubes, that gives it a three-dimensional character. As you can, see, as you'll see uh, shortly, um, we can actually see a 3D phase diagram in this system by coupling those tubes together. So, um, so we can we can change the tunnel coupling, this parameter t, by reducing the depth of the optical lattice. We can also use the Feshbach resonance to vary interactions. And it turns out that reducing the interactions um, reduces pair binding energy. So the pairs in one dimension are actually all bound. And that increases pair tunneling. So weak interactions on the BCS side makes the system more 3D-like because they can tunnel more readily. And lowering the lattice depth makes the system more 3D-like as well. So this has been uh, discussed uh, by various people, including Parrish and Hughes and Mueller in this paper, uh, Erhai Zhao and, and Victor Liu, and Kai Sun and Carlos Balesh, and uh, in, uh, in Germany, Heydrich Meissner, and, or in, uh, uh, in Finland, I guess, uh, Pavi Torma. So there's been uh, a lot of theory. There's there's literally hundreds, if not thousands, of papers on FFLO physics since 1964. Uh, but in the context of cold atoms, I want to particularly mention Torma, Parrish, uh, Heydrich Meissner, Mueller, Kun Young, Leo, Dan Sheehy, Carlos Bolesh, Han Pu, Hank Stoke, 
and others. There's really been a lot. And Leo has um, done some of the pioneering uh, early papers uh, in the early uh, 2000s um, with, with Sheehy um, that, were, that were definitive and, uh, and rigorous. Okay, so, so this is now gonna be our target. We want to understand what this what this uh, dimensional crossover looks like and what it does. So this is from Parrish et al. from 2007, in which he showed in the mean field the 1D to 3D crossover. So this phase diagram doesn't really look very 1D-like because I I can't start in the center and go through uh, a series of shells. Um, but it's in the crossover region where there's a balanced superfluid phase, there's a fully polarized ferromagnetic phase, there's a normal partially polarized phase, then there's two FFLO phases, one which is called commensurate and the other one incommensurate. And it has to do with the LO order parameter that we discussed yesterday. The LO order parameter is spatially modulated. The density is spatially modulated. And so this commensurate means how many, um, how many upspin atoms are commensurate versus incommensurate means how many upspin atoms uh, are occupying a given uh, domain boundary. And commensurate means that exactly one uh, atom is in a domain boundary, and that's what we'll be focusing on. So I want to also draw your attention to these little lines in the circle in here. The circle is where these people estimate the largest uh, order parameter to be, um, and this with you know somewhere around mu is equal to 0 0.3 and h is around 0 0.6, and the dash line is where um, D, DQ, the, um, the FFLO wave vector, the derivative of, of Q uh, with respect to um, chemical potential is equal to zero. So if you have a cloud with an inhomogeneous density profile, um, you, if you're around this region of the phase diagram, uh, the inhomogeneity is not going to hurt you so bad. So the, the FFLO wave vector can be more or less constant in this, in this region. And that's an important ingredient as well. So this is what, um, what we found in this bundle of one-dimensional tubes where we start increasing the tunnel coupling between tubes. So for small tunnel coupling, this is, looks a lot like what we had for the quasi 1D uh, phase diagram. We have data in which there is a partially polarized phase indicated by the spin density being non-zero. And, um, and it's close to a polarization, which is close to the PC1D, the critical polarization in 1D, where everything is FFLO. You can see the partially polarized phase extends all the way to the edges of the trap. And the black line is the, um, indicates the density of the upspin, the blue line, the downspin. So if we look at the local polarization using Able Transform, um, we can see that in this region that the, that the, lo the local polarization is relatively fixed at around uh, 20%. So this looks like, this is, looks like this system, except that the, uh, the FFLO region, this partially polarized region, actually extends most of the cloud because it's very close to PC1D. So those are just the phase diagrams. This is uh, in the middle where the, there's a partially polarized phase. And um, this is PC1D uh, shown here for uh, a tunnel coupling of 0 0.013 recoils. So very small tunnel coupling. So it looks really 1D-like. There's a superfluid um, 
and the edges of the cloud and a, a partially polarized phase in the middle. And there's no PC 3D. There's no region where the, there's a superfluid core, a balanced superfluid core doesn't exist in the 1D like phase diagram. In large T, it's a little different. So in large T, um, I have a, uh, a superfluid core in the middle. And uh, the PC1D is disappearing, this crossover between the spin density boundary and the minority boundary is, is, is converging to zero. And um, there's a superfluid uh, phase in the center of the trap, a balanced superfluid phase in the center of the trap. So you can see that here, if you look at PC3D, where that balanced superfluid core begins to disappear, actually requires some finite polarization. So I have until for, from up to this radius, I have, or up to this polarization, I have a, um, a balanced superfluid core, but beyond that, it disappears. And that's the Clogston limit. So this is what we mean by PC3D. So there's a dimensional there are problem. other yeah. questions in the chat, I think. Um, yeah. I, I, um, I think, Grace, you want to, to speak up? Um, yeah, so, um, so yesterday, I think you said that like you didn't include 2D in this because you just, you hadn't looked at it experimentally. Um, but are there particular, like how would this, mech how, how, is there a way to tune to make it 2D like? Um, and like, or also are there like, is there any theoretical prediction for what that phase diagram would look like? Yeah, uh, great question. So um, you can use a one dimensional optical lattice to create a, uh, a an array of, of two dimensional pancakes, like a stack of pancakes that occupies the, you know, with the periodicity of the, of the 1D lattice. So if you uh, make that lattice deep enough, um, you can really have isolated two dimensional systems. And there are other ways of, of making two dimensional systems as well. And people have um, began to study those. Um, I know John Thomas has, I think uh, Anna Maria, you mentioned um, uh, another Michael Cole is, used to have some experiments, Michael but Cole. I don't know. Michael Cole we used to have some experiments, but I don't know um, now what is he exploring. I mean, maybe yeah. he's exploring 2D lattice. I mean, yeah, maybe uh, in additional corrugation in the pancake to see 2D yeah. physics, like two layers with, with a lattice in, in each of them. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the theoretical phase diagram, that would be interesting. Um, I'm not sure what the status of that is theoretically, to be honest with you. Um, so I, I don't know um, where, you know, where FFLO comes into play in the two-dimensional phase diagram. But yeah, thanks. Any others? Okay. Matt, did you want to speak up? Him? Or if or you have yeah. just a comment? Mm -hmm. I was just saying, presumably by tuning one laser, lattice laser, not the other, you could do 1D to 2D as well, and 2D mm -hmm. to 3D. That's true. I, I have no, no idea what the physics would be there. But... Yeah, well, that's potentially something that, you know, that's potentially interesting. Yeah. No, that's that's a good idea. Um, nobody's done that, so that that's waiting for you. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. So uh, this is uh, in this slide. I'm showing this one-dimensional or three-dimensional crossover um, by changing tunnel coupling and changing the interactions. So um, this is the one D phase diagram where there is a finite uh, critical polarization. And this is the 3D phase diagram where that uh, uh, PC 
critical polarization of 1D is, is starting to disappear. And so you have a superfluid balanced superfluid core, whereas here in the center, you have a, a partially polarized superfluid phase. So these are different phase diagrams. So we can then, by plotting these values of PC1D and PC3D, we can, um, we can map out where that phase boundary is. So in 1D, the radius, the polarization of the central unpolarized core is zero because in 1D, we don't have a central unpolarized core. And in 3D, um, it's not zero. And so if one looks at the, as a function of tunnel coupling, one looks at uh, where these PC3D disappears or, or, first, or first appears, it's about here in uh, this uh, region of the phase diagram, somewhere in this, in this range. It's actually spread out. And um, if you, instead of plotting this PC3D versus tunnel coupling, you plot it versus scaled tunnel coupling. So remember that both the tunnel coupling T as well as the bi pair binding energy uh, enter into um, the uh, determination of, of the dimensionality of the system. And so if you scale T by the binding energy, um, you find that all the data collapses. And so this data is all for different values of interaction corresponding to different magnetic fields indicated here. So this really indicates that this, uh, this scaled tunneling is the proper way of looking at this dimensional crossover. If the scaled tunneling is small enough, it's 1D and there is no 3D critical polarization. And if it's bigger, then the system develops a central unpolarized superfluid core, and that looks more 3D-like. So below this vertical line, it's 1D-like, and above it, it's 3D-like. So what have we learned about FFLO in regards to this system? Well, in 1D, we know that the FFLO occupies a large region of the phase diagram, particularly if uh, the polarization is, is about equal to this critical polarization, which depends on interaction. And this is also a Fermi nesting effect as we discussed uh, yesterday. And so in 1D, you have perfect Fermi surface nesting. So even though the two Fermi surfaces have different radii, they can contact each other and overlap completely. In 3D, that's not true. But in 3D, you have an advantage where the hopping introduces some strong inner tube correlations. And that can help establish the main wall boundaries that are located at the same place from tube to tube. And that's important because if you want to do averaging of this density profile, you want to have the, the, um, the main boundaries the main walls to be phase locked together from tube to tube. And by introducing some tunnel coupling from one tube to the other, uh, then the system is able to lower its energy by uh, establishing these domain boundaries at the same phase or the same location from tube to tube. So uh, the other advantage of 3D is that there's long range order in a three dimensional system. And so it's more robust to quantum fluctuation and thermal fluctuation. So in one dimension, um, a finite temperature may completely destroy, destroy the FFLO correlations, even though the density profile looks like it should for an FFLO phase. So, um, so this was a big question. Will tunnel coupling cause the main walls to line up? Um, we think that it's possible and likely uh, but nobody, nobody knows. So remember that the, the FF phase has an order parameter of a traveling wave. 
and the LO phase has the order parameter of a standing wave. And so the LO phase has a spatially modulated density in which there can be domain walls where the order parameter uh, vanishes and the excess upspin atoms can live without adding, uh, without energy cost. It turns out that um, the Larkin and Chinnikov themselves pointed out in 1964 that the LO phase, this order parameter is lower in energy than this phase. So they, they had some, some reasons why um, that was the case. And everybody who's looked at this, uh, I think concludes that the LO phase is um, a lower energy phase than the FF phase. So the LO phase will look like this. So at P equals zero, the spin density is flat and the order parameter is flat. There's no spatial dependence on either of them. But at P not equal to zero, then there are these domain walls where excess unpaired spin up atoms can reside. So between them, it's all P equals zero. And then right at these domain boundaries, which whose locations are defined by the zeros of the order parameter, um, there's one uh, uh, in the commensurate FF below phase, there's one excess uh, unpaired spin up atom. So this is what the density profile or the spin density should look like in that case, um, which has a periodicity of twice the periodicity of the order parameter. So there are two zeros for every period of the order parameter. And at these zeros, the spin density can be non-zero. So again, this is the phase diagram from Parrish et al. And uh, where I pointed out before, this dashed line is where the FFLO momentum Q, uh, its derivative with respect to chemical potential is zero. And so this is kind of the region of the phase space that we're, that we're uh, living in. So, um, and that circle indicates where the order parameter is largest and is thus most robust to finite temperature fluctuations. So this is uh, what the, this is again, the definition of polarization and showing what the, a 3D to 1D uh, phase, phases look like. So in 3D, we start off with at zero polarization along this axis. We uh, increase polarization from left to right. It goes in 3D, it goes from being uh, completely paired uh, P equals zero superfluid to this shell structure when I get a finite uh, amount of polarization. And as I get more and more polarization, eventually I go through the Clarkson limit. I can no longer have this first order phase transition, it disappears. Eventually with increasing polarization, it goes to this ferromagnetic phase. In 1D, it's different. So in 1D, of course, if there's zero polarization, then I have uh, the whole entire cloud is unpolarized. Uh, but when I increase the polarization by a little bit, then, um, there's a little FFLO phase that emerges in the center that grows and it grows until I get to the critical polarization. And then beyond that, um, the FFLO phase is surrounded by this, um, this uh, ferromagnetic polarized uh, normal phase. All right, so that's our understanding of these phase diagrams in 1D and 3D. So, um, how, would, how yeah. would, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would just make a comment that uh, in 1D, purely 1D, unless the, th the system phase separates completely, like macroscopically phase separates, as soon as you have imbalance, any kind of an imbalance, that really is synonymous to FFLO. Just because in 1D, you know, having 
long, there's no long range order in the periodicity anyway. So any imbalance automatically gives you what, you know, FFLO is the, just an imbalanced state. Mm -hmm. It just because there's no such thing as, you know, in 1D, the, the order is either short range or quasi long range, depending on whether you're at finite or zero temperature. Mm -hmm. And so, and so there's no difference. So at least theoretically one expects that there are power law uh, finite momentum correlations that fall off as power law in, in all of your yellow regions. Like where there's a fight, there's a, there's a, where there's a polarization. It's not fully polarized, yeah. but partially polarized. Yeah. So I guess the, the thing that we're trying to also do is to, by admitting some, uh, the, the three dimensions into the system that the, it's more robust against finite temperature fluctuation. Right, right, right. But can you do like uh, Brack scattering or some, you know, the, the I'll I show you in a minute. What, yeah. I'll show you in okay. a minute what we've done. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Al almost there. It's almost there. Okay, we, actually, we actually have some data. So um, we, in order to maximize our, uh, our, ability to see these domain walls, we kept the polarization small under about 5%. So the domain wall separation um, was above our optical imaging resolution of about three microns. And that corresponds to something like the polarization around 7%. So we wanted to keep it below that. And so um, we also wanted to um, maximize or, or sorry, minimize the PC1D, which is uh, varied by changing interaction strength. And so we're on the BCS side of the Feshbach resonance. The 3D scattering length is about minus 6,000. So it's in the strongly interacting regime, but on the negative side, on the attractive uh, side of the Feshbach resonance. And then the, um, the lattice depth is uh, adjusted to keep to to be on the 1D side of the dimensional crossover, but just barely on the 1D side. So the tunnel coupling is as large as it can be in order to, to uh, have the advantages of being in a 3D system, um, but still being uh, having a, a, a 1D phase diagram where a large portion of this cloud is, um, is in the FFLO state. That occurs for these parameters at a polarization of around nine percent. So those are the considerations that go into finding, you know, a sweet spot where we can see domain walls if they exist, and um, and, uh, and and their, and their probability of of them existing there is maximized. So this is how we did the experiment. So. Um, we did use something called phase contrast imaging. And with phase contrast imaging, um, we can detune the imaging probe between the two states that constitute our up, spin up, spin down system. And so by doing this, we're sensitive only to spin density. And in fact, all the spin density, the red lines that I was showing you, the red uh, phase diagrams, um, those data points were obtained by measuring directly the spin density by detuning halfway in between these two uh, spin states uh, up these for spin down and spin up. So that's the first image. And so that, if there are domain walls, they would show up immediately in this periodically spaced uh, array of spin up atoms. And the second image is detuned much further from resonance. It's detuned from both the spin, uh, detuned from both the up spins and the down spins, and that enables us to measure a number density of uh, the sum of the spin up and spin down atoms. And so, from the number density, we can calculate Q from just uh, assuming that they're a non-interacting uh, Fermi gas with a certain number of spin up and spin down atoms and a uh, harmonic oscillator length scale in the axial direction, in this C direction. 
All right, so this is what we see. So we take such an image where we're looking at the spin density, and then we take an FFT of that spin density. So if there is something periodic, we should be able to see a peak uh, in this FFT at the uh, spatial frequency that corresponds to the value that we expect the, the, the period is the FFLO periodicity to attain, which is Q over pi. So um, it turns out that there's just not enough signal to noise to detect a single atom on a background of, you know, 50 or 100 other atoms in the, in the gas. So um, we had to do some averaging. Can so you say this, this is like a single, this is coming from many tubes or? Yeah, so this is a single image, uh, but over many tubes. Many tubes, yeah. okay, and all yeah. all tubes are like there are different densities, of course, and different chemical potential. Too. Correct, correct. So they're you don't expect the well, they, so they have different cues. They they have the limit. They have somewhat different cues, but the idea is to go to this location that Parrish identified um, mm. in the phase diagram where the dqd the Mu is, is zero. Oh, I see. So they're at least, it's a sweet spot. Okay, I understand. It's, it's, it's a spot yeah. where the periodicity uh, should be more or less the same, mm -hmm. independent of density, or independent of chemical potential, I should say. So, so how, strong it, is the, how strong is the inner tube coupling in this, in this experiment? Um, or maybe... It's so, a different figure of merit. Yeah, there, no, that is the exact figure of merit. So it's this, there's a scaled tunneling parameter that is, is scaled by the pair binding energy. And we find the dimensional crossover corresponds to something like uh, that scaled parameter being 0 0.02. 0 0.02, I see. Okay. Okay, thank so, you. Yeah. So, so there's not really enough signal to noise in a single image to be able to see the, the right spatial periodicity. So it turns out that this peak here is actually real. And, um, and if we average, then we can see it. So what we do is we average the data by uh, binning each image that we took. We took hundreds of images. And we know what their value of Q is because we know what the numbers and polarizations are. So we bin each image according to what value of Q it corresponds to. And then we identify the highest FFT peak in each image. So in this image, it would be this peak. And we average the peak location for each value of Q. So we have like 20 of these images for each value of Q, we take the FFT, we find the highest peak in that each of those FFTs, each of those 20 FFTs, and we calculate the mean of that, uh, of that peak, that peak location. And that's what happens. So if we, um, we, since we know Q on this horizontal axis, we can calculate what that is. And this is the spatial frequency measured by the FFT on this axis. So in the ideal sense that uh, this K over two pi, the spatial periodicity is equal to the calculated uh, FFLO domain wall spacing, everything would fall in this line. And you can see it does a pretty good job. And it, it really, uh, it shocked us to, to see this. So this really constitutes um, evidence for FFLO domain walls. It's all very preliminary. This is, this is very recent. And- uh, So Randy, can you call it clarify? Yeah. The K is the, stand, is the strength of the harmonic confinement? That, 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 that's, what is Q, the vertical Q again? Yeah, the so vertical this, K, the vertical K? Yeah, this vertical K is the FFT uh, spatial frequency. Ah, okay. So, I see. So, so let me back up here. So um, 
the FFT has uh, spatial frequencies that uh, correspond to various noise or in some okay. instances, actual yeah. signal. Right. But no, they're, about, they're about the same. Uh, and that spatial frequency is what we're calling K. Okay. So this would be K of about 0.26 or so for mm -hmm. this peak. Mm -hmm. And we expected something like 0.21. So we calculated Q from the numbers uh, in the image. And we get uh, that Q is, is around 0.21. Excellent. And so there's a, there's a definite linear relationship, but there's an offset from this exact one-to-one uh, -one correspondence. Awesome. But, but Q, so Q is a purely theoretical object. You, Q, Q, is is the Q, is, Q is measured because we, we measure uh, the Fermi energies for each uh, spin state. Let me back up and show that. It's the it's this Fermi surface mismatch. Is that what Q is? It's this, yeah. Okay, this. but it right. I mean, it's the. It has no interactions measure. in it. Right. Well, I mean, Q is the exp right. It, it's what it is right there on the left panel. I see. Yeah. So. But, That's Q that we. You know, this this is a very simple-minded picture of what Q and should you, be. Yeah, so and you varying, and you varying this uh, the way you vary Q to get, and then corresponding variation in K in this linear relation that you find. That's just by looking at different parts of the cloud, or are you varying. What no. are you varying? So we we can vary Q by varying the polarization, and mm -hmm. um, we. We do that by using RF sweeps through the transition between the upspins and the downspin. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. uh, do uh, non adiabatic uh, transfers, spin state transfers, by sweeping, sweeping a frequency through resonance. I can, Randy, can you explain again? I missed it. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, the first image, what are you calling your first image? Why, when you do tune in between the up and down, then you're sensitive to the to the, uh, the yeah. you know, spin spin. Because the, the, yeah, it's because this this detuning is insensitive to to pair densities. So the signal, the phase contrast signal from the up spins and the down spins are exactly equal and opposite. And oh, so it's just the phase shift. I get well, it's just so the phase cancel? shift. It's okay, a phase shift that cancels. Oh, one, of them, one of them produces a positive phase contrast signal and the other one a negative one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it's a way of being, being blind to those. So in fact, if we just take an unpolarized sample, we just take a distribution in which there's exactly the same number of upspins and downspins, and we image it in using this detuning, we find that the signal is is essentially zero. Mm. So the so you look at the with that signal, you just see no light coming out. You see, no, you see no light. Most, no light. I see. Yeah, there's no absorption. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. This is clever. Yeah. So this this is a yeah this was the key because this gave us a discrimination between pairs and uh, and, and up spins. Okay, so um, that's what we see. It's preliminary, um, but I'm very encouraged at, at doing what we expect it to do. Um, we've been trying other things like looking at, um, at uh, a 3D gas. So this is a, a, a sample which, is, which there's no optical lattice. It's all in three dimensions. And we do exactly the same experiment. We have less data here. But we do exactly the same experiment where um, we measure, um, we bend, bend the data up according to Q, and then we measure uh, the highest FFT, highest peak in the FFT, average those peaks together, and uh, calculate their mean, and then plot that here. 
and you can see there's really no correlation like there was in the case of, uh, of the 1D, quasi 1D lattice. All right, so I think I'm done <clears throat> with what I wanted to say. And of course, there's still time for questions. Uh, but let me uh, acknowledge the people who did this work. <clears throat> in particular, the latest work was done by Jake Fry. Before that, Melissa Ravel and Anna Marchand, the postdoc, who's now back in Britain. All right, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Excellent. My pleasure. Yeah, I, I might have, I have a question perhaps. First of all, yeah. thanks for the nice talk. That was really nice. And it's really exciting to see this nice uh, uh, slope here coming up. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have a question generally. I mean, okay, you can see this, this, the, the, this, the, the Q scales like this. Moment. Is there any way of measuring the momentum distribution itself of pairs? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there probably is. I don't know of one that would be practical for us, given our, you know, that what our capabilities are. Um, but the, you know, given the LO onsets, um, measuring the domain walls is equivalent to measuring the the um, center of mass momentum. Yeah. Okay. No, I was just curious. I mean, this uh, what, what I would expect is that you see a peak, basically, in the parent momentum distribution. That this is this momentum. This would also be exciting. Yeah, yeah. So that, yeah. So that would be uh, you'd see some kind of a uh, single peak. So, I mean, that's kind of what the FFT is. The Q that where the peak is in the FFT is the Q that corresponds to the momentum of the pairs. Yeah. Exactly. So this, yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so this this peak is equivalent to Q. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I can see it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, could you explain again what the difference was between like there was two FFLO um, phases inside in the in the phase diagram with the, um, like for the 1D, 3D crossover, there was like an FFLO C and an FFLO IC. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah, so I think you mean this one? Yeah. Yeah, so um, the C stands for commensurate and incommensurate. And um, the commensurate case were, was that there's exactly one spin up atom per, um, per domain wall. And the incommensurate means that it's different than from one. So this this uh, this can occur at larger polarizations where you have more excess spin up atoms, and in that case they could multiply occupy a domain wall. Does that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So the the white line in between them is that that's just the. the yeah, noise. it's it's some kind of a a separation between them. I guess it's not really a phase boundary but it's just uh, segregating regions where um, everything on to the left seems to be commensurate to the right seems to be incommensurate. Okay. Sorry, commensurate with what? Commensuration between what and what? Well, the meaning domain. that there's one atom per domain wall. Oh, versus some fraction, okay. Versus something, versus something that could vary from tube right. to tube. This is the key experimentally. And actually we're, we're guided entirely by Mira's phase diagram 
and uh, and the experiment uh, is motivated by their 2007 uh, paper, where they uh, point out that that you can stabilize the system with quasi long range order uh, by couple by coupling tubes. Randy, uh, yeah. what are the new prospects for the experiments uh, now that you have this, this very nice yeah. result? So the nice thing that we would like to do is, um, is to be able to explore the entire phase diagram, to be able to uh, vary the magnetic field and therefore the interaction strength, and to vary the tunnel coupling, and to see the strength of the FFLO correlations as a function of those parameters. So I think that we could, you know, we could map out um, a phase diagram. Uh, it'll take a lot of work and a lot of data, um, but I, you know, I think that we could do that. And it might be interesting to see this incommensurate phase. You know, if, ultimately, if we had good enough uh, uh, imaging, uh, good, good enough signal to noise in our imaging. I would like to be able to see domain walls in an image itself. So to be able to see periodic dark uh, bars, you know, corresponding to the domain walls and with an image with not an FFT, but an actual image. So with, you know, with good enough signal to noise, you should be able to do that. Yeah, but, but thanks. Did you say what uh, scattering like this corresponds to? Where are you in the in terms of the detuning or in terms of the flashback resonance? Yeah, it's like 940 Gauss, which is um, about minus 6,000 bore, minus 5,300 bore. So you're on the BCS side of the... Yes. I see. And we're on the we're on the BCS side because that's more uh, 3D like. The pair, you know, the pair binding energy is smaller. So I guess uh, are there any further questions? I had one more question. Uh, yeah. So there's a you know much simpler limit, which doesn't have to do with FFLO, but uh, still just to kind of gauge whether every in a simple limit things are working well, mm -hmm. or whether you understand the simple limit. Like if you go deep into into the uh, you know, molecular side of the BCS BC crossover, where you have molecules, you know, uh, and then you begin to, well, but, but you look at the imbalance system there. Do you know how does the system behave there? Does it face separate into unpair, you know, uh, imbalanced fermions and then the tightly bound pairs, or is yeah. there a homogeneous state? Which is a you know you know uniform state of uh, in, of molecules plus the Fermi liquid. Yeah, so that um, one could in three in three D we've looked at that question. Um, it's this it's this thing. So this tells us uh, below below this line this black line. Um, the system has a superfluid core. And as you go onto the BC, BEC side, um, it uh, becomes a post Fermi mixture. So mm -hmm. it, it admits uh, it doesn't have, it no longer has a superfluid core, you know, above this line. Um, but it has rather uh, a, has pairs and free atoms coexisting. 
So it's, it no longer face separates. It does not face separate. So, right. but what does it what does it look like? Where are the free atoms or the Fermi liquid relative to the to the, the molecular? Yeah, the bosons. Yeah. Where yeah. are they in the cloud radial? I mean, like spatially. I mean. So uh, they'd be in the center. So as you uh, you know, go to farther and farther on the BE side, BEC side. For a given polarization, eventually um, you would lose the superfluid, uh, the, the balanced superfluid core, and it would become a Bose Fermi mixture. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that is a second order phase transition mm -hmm. between this side and this side. I see. Okay, that's very nice. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, my pleasure. So if there are no further questions, thank you for the opportunity to, for, for me to speak at your summer school. I've really quite enjoyed it. And I know it's not the same as being in person, but um, you guys have done a great job of, of uh, approximating it. So, so thank you. Thank you for including me. Thank you, Randy. And, and enjoy thank the so rest much. of Enjoy the rest of the school. Thank you. All right. Bye. Okay, so I think we're gonna break uh, and uh, reconvene uh, for 11 o'clock for, uh, and Randy, maybe you can join us. Uh, there's a week's overview discussion, question and answers. Uh, what have right. we learned at eleven at eleven o'clock? Right. So it's safe. I'll, I'll yeah. try. I can't. I won't. I won't guarantee anything, but I'll try. I got. I got something else going on. Sounds good. Well, yeah. Even if All you're right. part of it, if you if you can, but if you cannot, that's no problem. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. My pleasure. Okay. Uh, we'll see everyone in uh, half an hour. <laughs>